Welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from tolovehonorandvacuum.com where we like to talk about healthy, evidence-based, biblical advice for your marriage. This is like kind of a stepping out of what we normally talk about. This isn't an advice podcast per se, but this is going to be fun because this is going to be a hands-on podcast. We're going to help you walk through how to figure out if you can trust the books you're reading. I'm going to say, with the topics that we talk about, you saying this is a hands-on podcast <laughs> before you have introduced what the actual like topic is, I'm betting a lot of people are like, what? <laughs> okay. This is true, especially with some of the social media posts lately. But anyway. Yes. yes. You mean a practical approach to things. Yes. yes. That's what I mean. Here we go. And I am joined today by my husband, Keith. Hey, everybody. And as usual, my daughter, Rebecca. Hello. And uh, yeah, we are going to talk about how to make sure that the advice that you are reading in books, that a book that you are reading is actually healthy. Mm -hmm. Because one of the big things we found in The Great Sex Rescue is that some teachings actually harm. It's not just that some teachings are bad or wrong or you disagree with them or they're not biblical or, you know, it's that they actually do quantifiable harm, mm -hmm. right? If you believe the obligation sex message, you have twice the rate of vaginismus as other people. If you believe that all men struggle with lust, it's every man's battle. You are far less likely to trust your husband once you're married. Like mm -hmm. lots and lots of quantifiable harm. And I know I say more likely and less likely because I can't remember the numbers. If you want the actual numbers, they're in the book. <laughs> Joanna yes. did them. It's amazing. <laughs> so we found the stuff did actual harm. And the thing is, there's so much uh, different opinions out there about mm -hmm. how you should do marriage. Mm -hmm. And I get it as a pediatrician, I get parenting stuff. There's so mm -hmm. many different ways of parenting. So they come to me as a pediatrician for expert advice. And what I use is evidence. Mm -hmm. We look at what the evidence is out there. We make decisions based upon what's been proven to work. And that's what we're going to talk about today in terms of marriage. Yeah. And that's exactly what Jesus actually told us to do. Mm -hmm. Because he said that a good tree cannot bear bad, bad fruit. fruit. Bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And so one of the ways that we tell whether something is of God is whether or not it's bearing good fruit. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When we have truth, we have Jesus. Even if that truth is found by the American Sociological Association, <laughs> or by the Census Bureau, yeah. or by gynecological researchers who aren't Christians. Like, truth is truth, and we don't need to be afraid of it. That's correct. Uh -huh. Yeah. And when we're walking in truth, we are walking closer to Jesus, and we are walking in the way, the truth, and the life. And that's, that's important to know. And so we shouldn't be afraid of evidence. Mm -hmm. We should actually seek evidence out. And on the other hand, if we are saying something is from God, mm -hmm. and it's provably harmful, Mm -hmm. We need to reevaluate whether that's really from God. Exactly. That is a sign that perhaps the things that we are believing are not actually Christian because I believe that God is good yeah. <laughs> and that he wants Amen. good things for us. What we want to do in this podcast is walk everyone through tangible step-by-step -step ways to tell whether something is harmful or not. And so I just, I just do want to hone in on this harm a little bit more because I had someone say to me recently, but Sheila... People tell me the Bible harms them, like everything mm -hmm. can harm. We're not saying that people said certain things harmed them. Yes. We're saying that we measured certain beliefs and found that those beliefs harmed. Yeah, <laughs> it's very different. Yeah. Also, let's like, okay, this, this whole red herring that's often thrown where like, well, the Bible causes harm or mm -hmm. like, you know, people say that being a Christian harmed them. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you look at the stats, religiosity is a protective factor for mental health. It's a protective factor for your relationships. In mm -hmm. general, religious people actually studies have shown religiosity does not harm. Right. On average. Mm -hmm. You may have individuals who are harmed by religiosity or harmed by churches. And the question is then why? Why are these people different from the rest of the trends? And I mean, based on our research, it's probably because of harmful teachings in Christianity that they yeah. were exposed to. Yeah. Yes. So it's not religiosity. It's not Christianity per mm -hmm. se. It's the harmful extra biblical teachings, most likely, when you actually look at the data. Mm -hmm. What I'm really calling for, I think, and this is what we desperately need when it comes to marriage, sex, and parenting resources in the Christian world is standards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need some basic standards because what's happened lately over the last few decades as the Christian publishing world has grown is that basically anyone with an idea 
has been allowed to write a book. <laughs> and if that person is charismatic enough and has a big enough platform, that book can go really big. Just because you write a bestseller does not mean that the book is correct. No. Mm. I mean, Mein Kampf was a bestseller, for pity's sake. Yep. Created to be his helpmeet is, sells really well in, in homeschooling circles. And it's one of the most toxic books there is. Just because a book is a bestseller means nothing. Mm -hmm. What we need to know is whether or not it harms. And so we're calling for standards. And my two big standards are this. Things should be evidence-based and there should be accountability. Yeah. So let's start with evidence-based. The first thing that I wanted to talk about, because this one really matters to me, mm -hmm. is that people often use credentials to say that their work is evidence-based. Like, oh, well, I have a doctorate in theology. I'm a pastor of a mm -hmm. mega church. I have worked in a pastoral position for 20 years and counseled many, many couples. Mm -hmm. Um. Your credentials are not evidence. Right. Not necessarily. If I need a brain surgeon, I don't want a podiatrist <laughs> doing that surgery. Yeah. Right? Like your credentials only matter if they are in the right field, first of all. Yeah. But also, yeah. your credentials alone do not mean that you're giving evidence-based advice. We all know there are terrible therapists out there who are licensed therapists. Yeah. Like it has to be backed up by research, not just your credentials. That's right. And I mean, as, as doctors, we all have our areas of specialty and we defer to other doctors who are specialists in that area. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if I'm a theologian, that's great. That's wonderful. I have those credentials. That does not automatically qualify me to speak about marriage. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It and does not automatically qualify me to speak about other things other than theology. Thank and you. And even if I were speaking about theology, if you are a person who is practicing your area of expertise in a way that is, it has integrity you will be citing the research that backs up your point. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even in your own area of expertise, you will show how what you're saying is true based on things other than just, I said so. Okay, so let's give you some concrete examples of how to tell whether people are evidence-based. So number one, if you make a claim, it needs to be backed up. You can't just say, state something and then leave it hanging with no claim. And I'm gonna give you an example of someone who did that. Here we have the book Love and Respect by yep. Emerson Egrich. And he says on page 221, to set up a marriage with two equals at the head is to set it up for failure. This is one of the big reasons that people are divorcing right and left today. Oh, so, and what's the footnote on that? Tell me what footnote, what, what resource does he cite there on his footnote for that claim he made? Interestingly, <laughs> he does not cite any research. And in our copy, if you will see in the margin there, Keith has has noted on what evidence. <laughs> yes, yeah, so. and this is this is before today. This is back when I read it like, yes. the first time. So, because this drives drives me crazy, and I put it in my most one of my more recent blog posts. Mm -hmm. He comes out with this statement. It's a bold statement, and if you believe this statement, it really backs up everything he's saying. The problem is, it has absolutely no evidence, and in fact, all the evidence points exactly in the opposite direction to what he's saying. Mm -hmm. So this is the problem. You cannot just make claims. That is not integrity when you say something that you believe is true with no evidence, especially when there's very easily accessible evidence out there that mm -hmm. proves it's actually wrong. Yeah, I mean, in this case, John Gottman Institute found that in a marriage where they don't share power, where the husband makes the decisions, there's an 81% chance of divorce, and we found a seven um, times seven higher. Times higher. And, and he cannot feign ignorance of John Gottman's work because he quotes he, he John quotes Gottman. John Gottman. Yes. Mis misquotes him. But. John Gottman's the only um, actual expert that he quotes in love and respect, but he misuses John Gottman's research. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's give examples. Let's say that someone were to say, as we all know, teen pregnancy rates are rising. Mm -hmm. And so we need to get more real about sex ed. So that's excellent. That's a perfect place for a citation. Yes. Yep. Because you can't just claim teen pregnancy rates are rising without showing some evidence. <laughs> or if you were to say something like, we all know that without spanking, children turn out badly. Oh, don't get me started on that one. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you can't make a claim without going to the evidence. And with all of these things about trends, about what approaches actually work and have better outcomes, there are so many studies. There are. And the thing is that if you are citing a study that's clearly not the best in the field, someone else can call you out on that mm -hmm. and say, hey, your research is like 20 years outdated. Mm -hmm. Or your research was like really easily refuted by all these other researchers. 
Yeah, or, or, so you can't just cherry pick. You can't no. just cherry pick the data. Like one of the rules you had, what, what, what were you told when you were in university? Oh, we, we had many rules <laughs> about how we were allowed to use research in my undergrad for psychology. But when, when I was um, studying for all of this, pretty much you had to have the most recent largest study you could find for a point. Mm -hmm. You couldn't just cherry pick the one that found what you wanted. I was in a clinical psychology kind of stream for my mm -hmm. undergrad and we had our end of our end of semester assignment where we had to in essence pretend that we were clinical psychologists who were going to give <laughs> an evidence-based treatment. We had the choice to go through all these different research um, options and we had to choose the best one. It was always the most recent one and it was the largest study and it was the one that was um, in general, uh, on these large bases like Cochrane database or the yeah. really big good ones. You aren't looking in your psychology for very specific subgroup that's not related to your person journal. <laughs> right. You're usually looking for research that's been done in the last 10 years. Yeah. Yep. So research that was done 25 years ago is usually out of date. Yep. Now, when do you not need to do that? When do you not need a citation? Mm -hmm. Well, it's when you yourself are the actual expert in this. So if you're writing a book on your own research, for example, mm -hmm. you know, you are you are allowed, like we actually did cite ourselves by mm -hmm. you. You can yes. see all of our numbers in the footnotes, but when we talked about our data, for example, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't have to cite an external source for our data because there is no external source. We are the source. Or I was recently reading a book by the top negotiator with the FBI on negotiation tactics. And he worked for 20 years. He figured out how to negotiate in hostage situations. And so he doesn't necessarily need to cite things about how we know this works better than that because he's the one who figured out what works better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but even that is the lowest level of evidence. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's a standardized grading system for levels of evidence. Uh, like at the top is the most highly scientific trials and stuff like that. And then all the way down to expert opinion. Mm -hmm. yep. And expert opinion is a level of evidence, yeah. but it's the lowest level of evidence. Yeah. And it's in your field. Yes. yes. <laughs> Again, this isn't a theologian who said, I've talked to 800 couples. And I know that the biggest reason for divorce these days is because people have two heads at the marriage. Like, yeah. No, no, it doesn't matter what your theologian has done. What matters is the research. And so we're just saying, if you're reading a book, and they're making a claim, and there is no little footnote number there, <laughs> yeah. that's a sign that they haven't done the work and that, mm -hmm. they, they, that this book is not properly researched. Mm -hmm. yeah. Above expert opinion, there's like different levels of evidence, right? Okay. So, so case reports is one of the lowest levels of evidence, <laughs> right? So I saw something happened and I documented it, and so therefore, and like this person had this problem, we treated it with this drug and they got better. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a case report, mm -hmm. right? Now that's a level of evidence, but it's a very, very low level of evidence, <laughs> right? Because maybe that was the one in a million chance it was actually going to work and it would have mm -hmm. actually, you know, killed the 99% of other people who would have taken it, right? Yeah. yeah. And then there's, there's like sort of case controls where a bunch of people, some people got it, some people didn't, all the way up to like these really scientific struggles. And yeah. what I find happening in the Christian church all the time is we use case reports as just rock solid evidence. <laughs> and for instance, there was an article this week that I read. Mm -hmm. um, Gary Thomas wrote an article um, talking about how your wife can't cure your porn addiction, but she can help it. Now, I don't know if that article is still up. We we're recording this podcast last week. Um, I did mention in the podcast notes of last week's podcast that um, at that point he hadn't taken it down, even though we had had conversations with him about how, how problematic that article was. But in his article, he kept giving the advice that no one has to have sex and sex can't prevent porn use, but then his anecdote showed the exact opposite. Yeah, and so this is what really drove me batty. Mm -hmm. He gives this story of a person who's addicted to porn. And the story goes that he knew he needed to stop, but he couldn't. And then he said, look, I'm married now, I need to stop, but he couldn't. He was an elder, he had started having kids. I'm a dad now, I need to stop, and he couldn't. And then he became an elder in the church. I'm an elder in the church now, I need to stop, but he couldn't. And he couldn't stop and he couldn't stop and he couldn't stop. And the f they were not having sex very much in their marriage. Once a month, maybe. And, he, and it was not until she started having sex more with him that he was able to stop porn. Mm -hmm. But what really bugged me was when he talked about they were having sex once a month and uh, only once a month, he says, and she was having an orgasm too. Here, so this, let, yeah, let me read it. I'll re I'll you want to read it? it? Okay, yeah, read what she actually, he actually yeah. said. I had orgasms, she explains. Jay wasn't a selfish lover. He never left me unsatisfied. And this is the key thing you want to talk about. This is Gary's interpretation. This blows apart the myth that sexual infrequency is always caused by a husband's selfishness or lack of hygiene. Yeah, so so this is the woman talking in that quote. She's saying that she was still having orgasms. So they were mm -hmm. having sex hardly ever. She was still having an orgasm. Therefore, this blows apart the myth that... <laughs> 
when marriages are sexless, it's because women aren't having orgasms. So okay. one woman well, and, and, can blow apart the myth. Well, it's not just that, okay? One so person. So what is this myth yeah. that yeah. women are not having sex because they're not enjoying it? Yeah. That's not a myth. Everything I've heard in the Christian church, sorry, I'm getting a little bit worked up. Everything I've heard in the Christian mm-hmm. church has been about how women are not having enough sex. And it's not because they're not enjoying it. It's because they're selfish or because mm-hmm. they don't realize how much men need it or that kind of thing. I have never heard this big myth about how the reason women are having sex is because they're not enjoying it. The first person I heard talking about that is Sheila. Yep. And that the, the reason that she came to that conclusion was not a myth. It was based on a study of 20 thousand women mm-hmm. and she didn't ask twenty thousand women if you're not having a lot of sex is it because you're not enjoying it mm-hmm. she asked about questions about how much sex they were having what they believe in their marriage all these kind of things and she found that in marriages where women are appreciated loved treated well enjoying sex yeah. they have sex regularly yeah and so this is called data this he's talking about in his post is a case report and he thinks a case report blows away well, the data. And yeah. in one our woman, own... one woman, and most of the stuff was Jay's point of view too. And yeah. this is what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah. This whole thing. One man yes. does not get to say, because this worked for me, that 20,000 women don't get their say. Well, what I was going to say too is in looking at the data, mm-hmm. this is why case reports don't are not better than actual data with large numbers of people because our data included lots of women who are having infrequent sex but orgasmed every time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They included lots of women. We even said that. Like yeah. there were five things that made sexless marriages more likely and yeah. orgasm was one of them but the average sexless marriage had at least two. Yeah, at least And two. not the average, like 70 pl- 70% plus. had at yeah. least two. Had at least so, two. And so it might be that maybe it's not that she can't orgasm, maybe it's that she's completely emotionally disconnected and he had a porn problem. So, you know, now I don't know that Gary's trying to critique Sheila's work there because, again... He hadn't cited it. Because unlike a professional, he's not citing where that information is coming from. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if he's attacking Sheila. But I have never heard anybody else saying anything other than the reason for sexless marriages is women's selfishness or women don't understand how much men need it. Mm -hmm. I've never heard anything else in the Christian church except for what Sheila is saying. So Mm -hmm. if he wants to critique something and provide an alternate, he needs to show people where the original information comes from and then prove why this now is different because of what he's showing. And we and we do have reasons. I, I do need to say yeah. it sounds like we're picking. Like, we do have reasons to to know that Gary is very familiar with our research, um, but hasn't endorsed it. Yeah, but the point very is familiar. the point is what we're trying to make is forget What's this. That? I said very familiar. Yeah. Per, forget the 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 specifics of this example. The point is you can't use a case report to nullify a massive study. Mm-hmm. Because like you just can't do that yeah. because you can pick, you can cherry pick. I can, I can find like my great uncle started smoking when he was twelve, and he died of a stroke when he was seventy-five. That proves that smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. No, it doesn't. <laughs> like, stop okay. it. <laughs> or like what I was, what I was saying earlier when we were talking about this whole thing. As I said, it's like, and and this is this is the thing they use. These authors often use anecdotes like this case report thing, where it's yeah. like, you know, we all know this, but here's an anecdote that shows you something different, right? So what if you have a book that says, you know what, guys, don't feed alligators. Give alligators a wide berth. It's not safe to go near alligators. Alligators are not going to want to snuggle you. <laughs> they're, they're really dangerous beings. But I'd like to tell you the story of Brian and Snappy. <laughs> When Brian first met Snappy, he was munching on a bag of, you know, cheddar cheese sun chips. And he saw this smiling little alligator. He just got this feeling, this is my new best friend. And he visited Snappy every day and he fed him sun chips. Within a day, he was having Snappy eating out of his hand. And now they've got this great relationship. They went to Disney World together. (laughs) He and Snappy are snuggling. And, you know, he says that nothing's better than those alligator cuddles. You know, and Brian and Snappy are so happy all because he fed Snappy some sun chips one day. So definitely don't go near alligators, but man, this guy's depression was cured. His anxiety was cured. He has a therapeutic alligator now. So definitely don't go near alligators. But you know, Brian is so grateful that he fed sun chips to Snappy, but please don't do it. Yeah, and that's what we see in a lot of books is books give all these caveats when it's actually fairly healthy advice it's like it's like the authors know they have to say this yeah but then their anecdotes 
show that they believe the opposite. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, legally, I can't tell a bunch of kids to go feed Sun Chips to Snappy. <laughs> but I really think that Brian has on to something here. Like, that's, that's what it sounds like, right? You're not actually going to end up with a bunch of kids with friends who are alligators. You're going to end up with, like, a bunch of people who got eaten by alligators. Yeah. You know? Like, it's yeah. just, this is the thing, is that you can't use a case study or case report or an anecdote to go against all of the data in the field. And you even know? the data in your own article, which yeah. is what you're saying. This is, this, mm -hmm. is, this, this, is, this is not intellectually honest. No. This yeah. is not showing integrity. You give all these caveats, and then you give an example where the thing you're supposedly preaching against Yep. is being done. Yeah. And so a really you can't do that. a really great litmus test as you're going through these books or through articles or even listening to sermons is is the teaching aligning with the examples. The mm -hmm. really big one that comes to mind for me is Shanti Feldon's For Young Women Only book that we've talked about, yep. where she has an entire chapter where she says to girls, boys have little ability and feel little responsibility to stop a sexual progression, so if you don't want to go there, it's better to not even start. She talks about how once you get past a certain point, it's just so difficult for boys mm -hmm. to stop, so they mm -hmm. need your help yeah. as a girl. Yeah. But, and then at the very end she says, and by the way, if anyone forces you to do something that's against your will, of course that's not your fault. But she spends an entire chapter mm -hmm. telling stories from boys about how they didn't want to do it, but they felt they, they couldn't stop. And so these anecdotes are directly against the caveat. And that should be a big red flag that yeah. what they're saying is, uh, is really tricky and that you should really, really be careful before you take their advice and you should probably ditch the book. Yeah. Another really big one is abuse. Mm -hmm. um, almost mm. every marriage book, even the worst marriage <laughs> books, even created to be his helpmeet for pity's sake by Debbie Pearl says, you know, that you shouldn't tolerate abuse and you should call the police. But then she gives an anecdote of a husband coming at his pregnant wife with a kitchen knife and Debbie's conclusion is what did the wife do to provoke the husband? Yeah, the conclusion was not to leave. The conclusion was not this woman was being abused. It, and so think about the that. So you're reading it and what you're hearing is, it's, it's sort of like you heard you heard an advertisement that where the drug said, this drug should not be used for asthma. This drug will aggravate asthma. But here's this woman who had really tight constricting of her chest and she had a really difficult time breathing and it got worse after exercise or when she was cold and she couldn't get air in and she took this drug and it was amazing. And so the, oh, someone <laughs> who's suffering from asthma is going to think, wow, I have a tightening of my chest. Mm. I have a hard time breathing. So I guess I don't have asthma. <laughs> because this this drug works for that case but you shouldn't use it for asthma so therefore i don't have asthma so when you give a disclaimer saying you should leave in cases of abuse or call the police but then you describe a husband coming at, a, at his wife with a kitchen knife the woman's gonna think if he's coming at me with a knife that's not abuse mm -hmm. because you told her i don't agree with abuse and you should get out if there's abuse yeah but here's a story where this happened and mm -hmm. she didn't get out and we're supporting that yeah, yeah or so else therefore that can't be abuse then. Or else... Which the, it obviously it is. Yeah, or else the person is going to be reading the book feeling like, okay, well, you know, you probably could leave during abuse, but this woman is better because she didn't. Because mm, I think too. it's not always that people are not able to recognize that it is abuse as much as they're told, even if it is abuse, the holy women stay. Absolutely. So that's why our disclaimers, yeah. our caveats cannot contradict what we say in our work. But rather our anecdotes, our case reports, the specific stories that we use need to back up the trends of research mm -hmm. or if there is an outlier we explain how this outlier still remains within the realm of mm -hmm. kind of the trends where it's like okay so what if you're not one of the you know 78 percent of marriages for which this is the problem yeah. then we'll talk about it but it's not about and so because there was you know 22 percent therefore the 78 percent is totally blown out of the water yeah. yeah okay so here's what we want you to do everybody go to your bookshelf right now Okay, if you are at home, I want you to go to your bookshelf. Pause. And I want you to take a couple of marriage or parenting books or sex books off of your bookshelf and bring them to wherever you're sitting listening to this. Or if yeah. you're doing dishes, just get them wet. Just go get the books <laughs> and bring them over because we want to walk you through how to tell if books handle research well. Okay, so the very first thing you're going to look at that can really help you see this is the footnotes. You're going to mm -hmm. turn, which usually are end notes, actually. You're going to turn to the end of the book. Making a Biblical Womanhood. Let's start with that one. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is not a marriage or sex or parenting book, but like 
a great book by Beth Allison Barr. She's going to be on the podcast. We already re recorded it, but she's coming on in November because she and Kristen DeMay from Jesus and John Wayne, we're going to do a webinar in December, a free one. It's going to be awesome. So we will have more information for you then. But like all of this, like this is footnotes. There's pages upon pages upon pages. All of this is footnotes and they're all in really, really small type. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like this is, this is crazy footnotes. Now hers is an academic book. So you assume that that would have footnotes. Um, great sex rescue. It's like originally sex rescue. our footnotes were 8,000 words. And just yeah. for reference, like the, like our book is 60,000 words. So yeah. <laughs> originally our photos were 8,000. We cut them down to 2,000. Okay. Yeah. But this is our, because Baker just didn't want 8,000 yeah. words. Yes. Baker <laughs> made us get rid of so many footnotes. It was fun. We understand. We're not, we're not yeah. getting mad at Baker. We have a lot of footnotes. You might say, well, why did you even need footnotes? Like to cite other things because you had your own research, but that's actually really important. Yeah. It's because one of the ways that you tell whether, even if someone's done their own study, they need to cite other studies which show the same thing to well, show that their study was valid. And that's what I was going to say is not only were there a lot of citations, the citations that we had were from, there were a lot of other peer reviewed academic journal articles. Mm -hmm. um, in essence, we were showing you our work, yeah. right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you have the differences in orgasm frequency articles here. You have explanations of our own research in here. It's not just us citing other people who we quoted for like, mm -hmm. oh, here's an interesting quote. So, someone else agrees with me. Yeah, look, <laughs> someone else agrees. It's like, no, like we actually gave you, here's some of the actual research that we did. And if you follow the research that's in the back of this book, Mm -hmm. you're going to be able to get a better yeah. understanding of this as well. So what, what you're looking for in the footnotes when you're talking about marriage, sex, parenting, is you want to see at least some academic articles. Okay, whatever book you're reading, there should be at least some academic articles. Mm -hmm. Give me How We Love by the Yurkoviches. This yeah. one does a good job of this, okay? This book is all about attachment theory. Yeah. Um, discovering Your Love Style, I highly recommend it. Love this book. And if you look at the footnotes, the, most of them are for big attachment theory textbooks yeah. and journal articles, and they do a lot of, ex of explaining. I say, what I actually love about how the Yurkoviches did their, their footnotes, and if we had more space, this is actually a lot of what we cut from our footnotes, yeah. is they actually explain why these different citations matter. Mm -hmm. It's like looking at, this was a ground breaking study by this person that showed this for the first time see it here now don't worry we're not saying you need to understand any of these journal yes. articles you just simply need to see that they are there okay yeah. you just need to look at the footnotes and say are there any journal articles and not journal of theology articles okay but like actual journal articles in medicine in psychology in sociology and something like that where there's reference to to some study that was done. <laughs> okay, yeah. that just shows that people did their due diligence. Okay, let's take a look. Why I didn't rebel. Even even this one, which Hello. you wrote. Yes, you wrote and, and I wanted to include this one because this one I specifically said in the very first chapter that I am not trying to give you like parenting advice or tell you how to parent your child. My entire point of this book was just to tell other people's stories and try to like draw themes from around them. And I even had journal articles <laughs> yes. cited in the back. Now, not all footnotes are equal. This is important no. to know, okay? So so you want there to be lots of footnotes. You want there to be journal articles, but not all footnotes are equal. So if you look at, can you pass me I Kiss Dating Goodbye? Okay. So what you'll notice here, Josh Harris, when he wrote I Kiss Dating Goodbye, and he's apologized for this book, so yeah. we're, not, we're not beating up on Josh. No, we're not. But, Josh but, would probably be the first person to admit this. Yeah. If you look, he's actually got quite a few footnotes. Like he's yeah. got three pages of footnotes, but none of them are journal articles. And a lot of them are books that were written in the 1930s. Yep. And it's all like Elizabeth Elliot and those kinds of people. So it's just, again, it, it's just kind of quoting other people who agree with him. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, versus, you know, showing how he came to his conclusions. Yes. And showing where he got quotations from, but not actual stuff. And by the way, if you quote people, you do need to cite them. Like having mm -hmm. people like Elizabeth Elliot in your, in your citations, not a bad thing. Yeah. Like making a, making a biblical womanhood has tons of citations where it's just where yeah. she got the quotes from from other people. We have tons of that in Great Sex Rescue. It's just that can't be the only yeah, thing Yeah, but you have. need to show where you got your ideas and your proof yeah. for what you're suggesting people do. And he exactly. didn't have any studies about dating, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, about that the effects on dating and getting married. None of that. No studies at all. Do you want to pass me love and respect? Now, he actually does have some footnotes in love and respect, which is interesting. He's got like... Quite a few, a lot of it is his own thoughts on things where he's expanding and a lot of it is, is, um, mm -hmm. is scripture references and Bible commentary references. He does quote Gottman, 
which is which is good. That's the only academic source he has. But the other things that he quotes are a book about gender differences that was published in 1965. Yeah, and, and remember he says that's a thorough study of the differences between men and women, and it was from 1965, and it was not an academic article; it was a book. More than that, because books can be based in academic um, yeah. articles. More than that, it was from 1965, and this book was published when, like 2004. 2004. Yeah. So really, he should not have been looking at something from 1965 to talk about gender when gender. Well, <laughs> you want he, the whole point of the book is to get us back to 1965. I was gonna yeah. say yeah. <laughs> but, like, had he done that in a university department, he would have failed the assignment. Yeah. Like you're not allowed to do that. Or you would have lost major points. Yeah. Yep. Okay, what about for women only? Now here, she did her own research, and you could say, well, she doesn't need to cite anyone because, you know, it is all her own research. But again, there's no citations here validating anything that she did to show that her research is in line with but other research. But not only that, when you read any academic article, if you didn't have to cite when you did your own research, then why would there be references at the end of each academic article? Like, yeah. an academic article says you did your own research, and oh, they have absolutely. tons of well, references. Because anybody who's an, a researcher of integrity yeah. recognizes they are part they are one piece of a puzzle mm -hmm. and you always give credit credit to the other people who are pieces of that puzzle mm -hmm. and you see how your work integrates with other people yes. so there should be tons of academic citations mm -hmm. for anybody who's doing quality research yeah. she has three citations just for general books and then she has five um, citations for movies or lord songs of the movies or songs and that's all she has in yeah lord of the rings star trek mm -hmm. when harry met sally however even that is better than can you pass me every man's battle and created to be his helpmate every man's battle if I turn to the back, there are no footnotes. no footnotes at all. Created to be his helpmate, no footnotes at all. Do not buy an advice book in marriage, sex, or parenting with no footnotes. Mm -hmm. It means they did not do their research. It means that everything they're telling you to do is not based on anything other than their own thoughts. Because the thing it's is, not evidence based. And now they may have said in the text, you know, there is a study that shows this. But the reason you want the footnotes, because the footnotes gives you exactly which journal it was in, which issue is in, which pages it is quoting from, mm -hmm. where you can find it, so that there's accountability. Yeah. When they're not putting it in proper citation format, they are not holding themselves accountable to other mm -hmm. people going and looking at their research so you're going to turn to the back of the book see that there are a lot of footnotes you want you, more is better than than fewer and yep. and fewer is better than none so you need you need some footnotes <laughs> the footnotes should have journal articles and the journal articles should be up to date yep journal articles or other academic sources other like academic textbooks sources. handbooks that kind yes. of thing okay um the other thing is when they use stats they need to use them correctly Yes. Yeah. So the big one that we've talked about before, which I still can't get over, Emerson Egrich um, quoting John Gottman saying that 85% <laughs> of men stonewall. And he says that in love and respect. Yeah. What John Gottman found was that 85% of stonewallers are male. Yes. Those are two very different things. If I tell you that 95% of murderers are male, that is not the same thing as saying 95% of men are murderers. <laughs> 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 and the fact that Emerson Eggers got that so wrong, and he's continued to get it wrong. Like from 2004, there was a sermon in 2019 that we shared with you. I'll put a link in the podcast notes that goes along with this to show you that he is still messing that stat up. Yeah. And again, you don't have to be the one to catch every single thing. Mm -hmm. But these are also things that when you see other people catching them, mm -hmm. just pay attention. Yeah, because it means that person has not done their work and you need to wonder if this is really evidence-based and safe. Okay, so that's number one, evidence-based. Number two is accountability. Yeah. Our advice should change when evidence changes. Yes. Mm -hmm. We studied in psychology all the time that, you know, in the late 1800s, even up to the early 1900s, heroin and cocaine were prescribed for anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a big thing Freud did. Freud was all about the cocaine. Yeah. You know, like, he was like, you feeling blue? I got something for you. <laughs> like, okay. And this was, this was actually a relatively accepted therapeutic practice. Yeah. And then they didn't realize how addictive it was. They didn't realize it was withdrawal symptoms. They didn't realize, you know. Yeah, but what happened was doctors started seeing this more and more. And they yeah. said, hey, wait, this is causing harm. And so they Maybe we advocated to have these things removed. And then and heroin was, I think, t was banned 
by the FDA, you're not until like 1924 or something, something like, like that. Something like that. Well, I mean, Coca-Cola, and, the Coca is about cocaine. I don't, I, I don't know if originally. that's a, is, is that, that, is a that myth? real or is that a myth? I thought they used. I thought they the, originally the, were going to put little bits. The, the point is this: is that people were touting this miracle cure of heroin or cocaine or whatever, mm-hmm. and then doctors were dealing with the fallout, yeah. and they were saying this is not safe, and it took lobbying and yeah. time mm-hmm. for this drug to get banned, mm-hmm. you know, this this way. And what you know, when you see people who are harming people. Yeah. We need to start speaking out and we need to take accountability. We need to say, you know what? I said that before, but now I'm seeing the fallout and I realize I shouldn't have said that. And yeah. we need to speak. We need to say something different. When you know better, you do better. That's, yeah. that's a principle that's of integrity. Said. And remember that it's not just enough to know better and do better in the future. You also have to hold yourself accountable yes. to helping the people who you may be harmed accidentally without knowing the repercussions. Yeah, unintentionally. Most of the people that we think spread the harmful messages did not intend to. No, absolutely. But when thalidomide, the drug that caused horrible birth defects for so many children, when it was found to be harmful, the doctors didn't just say, "Well, okay, I guess there's going to be some floating around on the streets, but we'll just kind of brush that under the rug and keep going forward." What they did was they personally yeah. called the yeah. patients who had been prescribed. Yeah, they called all their patients. They said, "If anyone has any thalidomide, please bring it into your local <laughs> pharmacy." Now, if if you had a car manufacturer that there was a de- Defect that was causing people to get killed in accidents yeah. and you heard that they said okay yeah we realize we shouldn't have done that we're gonna make the car differently now mm-hmm. and there's no recall what would you think exactly I mean, that is unacceptable mm-hmm. and and the thing is this we are Christians I mean we should be the first people to admit when we've done wrong and apologize and mm-hmm. repent and do differently in the future if a person refuses to repent and refuses to turn back from the faulty teachings they've given that have caused harm to people, they still believe those faulty teachings. If they didn't believe them, they wouldn't just stop teaching it. They would say, yeah, you know what? I contributed to something bad here and I want to do better. Please don't listen to what I said before. What Mm -hmm. I'm saying now is actually the right thing. And the thing is, those doctors who originally prescribed thalidomide were not doing anything wrong. No. they They were working with the best information they had at the time. It was only after they found out it was harmful if they kept prescribing it, they are now at fault. Exactly. And so, you know, once we know something is harmful, people need to stop saying it Mm -hmm. and they need to stop teaching it. And this is where we run into some issues with the with the Christian world because we, we've heard this before from someone is saying like, you know, well, there's a lot of times we're allowed to disagree. Like I, you know, we know in psychology that Freud was really ridiculous, but like also we take a lot of inspiration from his theories. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that in other areas of expertise, like psychology, like, you know, medicine, like sciences, we can acknowledge the good of what someone did, but we also decry the bad. Yeah. But what they're trying to get us to do in evangelicalism is not say, hey, so like, for instance, with Emerson Egrich, the crazy cycle really helped some couples, but overall, the book actually increases the risk of abuse mm-hmm. for people in really damaged things. They don't want us to say that. They want us to just say, we'll just talk about the good things from the book. It's like, well, that's not how we handle Freud. Mm-hmm. What we say is... Lol, look at this stuff that Freud believed. We do not do that anymore. And by the way, if you do that in practice, you will get sued. But he was the first one to talk about introspection really on a on a deep level. And so he yeah. was a founder of, psych- so of modern saying, psychology. So you're saying you give credit where credit is due. But you decry the bad. But you also say when they were wrong, they were wrong. Yeah, yeah. you are you, you give credit, but you also decry the bad just as loudly. And if mm-hmm. someone were to do a completely Freudian psychotherapeutic <laughs> technique today, mm-hmm. they would be open to everything every single lawsuit Mm -hmm. of malpractice. And so that's why we have to be careful when we recommend things where it's like, well, some of it is good, but some of it is bad because if Mm -hmm. we know some of it is bad, Mm-hmm. then we know we should not be recommending it. And there it. are enough marriage and sex books that you can find one that isn't mostly bad. Or exactly. even isn't partly bad. You really can. And I hear that so much. Well, every book can be twisted in some way. No. On our rubric for healthy sexuality teaching, we had 12 markers of healthy sexuality. The maximum you could get was 48. There were some books that scored very high. Gift of Sex by the Penner scored 47 out of 48. It did mm-hmm. not do harm. Love and Respect scored zero. <laughs> every Man's Battle scored 9 out of 48. 
48. They scored yep. in the harmful category. For women only scored 11, I believe. It was in the harmful category. And so the idea that, well, all books do a little bit of harm is not true. Mm -hmm. What we know is that there are some books that do a whole lot of harm, and it's because they tend to be based on some underlying ideas that we know cause harm. Mm -hmm. And some books, which are not based on those ideas, actually help. And so not all books say the same thing. Not all books are equally harmful, and we need to be a lot more discerning. So with accountability, all we're asking for people to do is to admit when they've been wrong and when they learn that there is a new way of talking about something which is helpful rather than harmful, that they adopt the new thing. <laughs> and that, that means going back and changing past teachings. Mm -hmm. Even if, like like I said before, I have taken two of my oldest books out of print, uh, To Love, Honor, Vacuum, and Honey, I Don't Have a Headache Tonight. I've asked for those to be out of print. I just recently completely rewrote The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex. The 10th anniversary edition is coming out in February. It's not that I thought any of it was bad. I just phrased things in ways that I wouldn't phrase them today. And so I had a great time rewriting that. And then Keith and I wrote The Companion, The Good Guy. Guide to Great Sex. I am so excited about them. And they're coming out in February. It's going to be awesome. But yeah, like you'd redo your stuff when you learn differently. And that isn't that isn't a lot to ask of teachers. No, like for instance, we, we know that there are some teachers out there who endorsed really really harmful stuff in the past, right? Yeah. They endorsed Mark Driscoll's work. They endorsed Every Man's Battle. Mm -hmm. And they've been called publicly to retract their endorsements. And they just haven't. And we don't understand why. Yeah. Because it would literally be like one or two tweets. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Like, it's so totally not Hey, a big guys, deal. Yeah. used yeah. to recommend this. Um, obviously, we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. I really apologize. Um, and in the future, I don't want to be associated with this kind of message. Yeah. Like, Easy. It isn't, it isn't a difficult thing to do. And so if you have your name... As an endorser on something that was harmful, you need to retract that endorsement once yeah. we know it's harmful. The other thing we do is we should not ever be platforming people that we know are harmful. Exactly. It's one thing to speak at a conference where someone else is speaking that is harmful. Totally. Because you're not the one giving them a platform. It is an entirely other thing to invite them to speak. Mm -hmm. That is you platforming someone. And even if you think, yeah, but they have helpful things to say, or well, they're not going to talk about the stuff that was harmful. You're still telling everybody this is a safe person and that yeah. other people could go and buy their previous works. Exactly. And so unless you do a big disclaimer, like I am having this person on to talk about this, this area, parenting, this they're unique really area good on parenting. What don't listen to what they said on sex, but they're really good on parenting. Unless you say don't listen to them on sex, yeah. <laughs> then you should not be platforming them at all. Yeah. And really you shouldn't be at all until they have said their story because they're doing some harm. Exactly. We, we have to, we can't enable all of this bad behavior among people who have caused mm -hmm. harm and have been called mm -hmm. out and they refuse to apologize. Okay, so let's wrap this up. For you individuals, here, here's really what I want to say. Okay, as, on an individual level, if you just want to figure out if a book is good or not, you know, look at the footnotes as we explained. Are there a lot? Are there journal articles? Is it up to date? Those, that's a good rule of thumb. But if you're a pastor, or if you're a small group leader and you're actually the one choosing which books to use, you do have to do a little bit, you do have to do just one more step <laughs> and, and really, really read the book through with a very discerning eye. Talk, look at for some of the things we talked about. Do the caveats match up with the anecdotes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do they make claims that they don't support? Like read the book first with a very discerning eye. Here's a couple of other tips. We do have that rubric, mm -hmm. our healthy sexuality rubric, um, the 12 marks of healthy sexuality, and it shows you how to grade books on a scale of zero to four on each one of those things. That's available for free, and we will put the download link so you can get that and you can apply it to whatever book you're reading. Exactly. <laughs> um, we would love it if people could create a rubric on parenting or on marriage. We've been asked to do that. The problem is when we created our sex one, we did it after... A, a lot of study. research. We did a huge literature review and we did a large study. So even though I think I know it would go in the parenting one, we haven't done the work to, to create that, like mm -hmm. to, to be able to create that because we do think it should be done properly. Um, so that's why we haven't done that yet. But you can get our sex one. Here's another tip. Go to Google, mm -hmm. type in the book title that you're thinking of doing, and then type in a word like abuse or controversy. Yep. This one works surprisingly well. <laughs> I'm going to say, if you type in love and respect and abuse, mm -hmm. it does not make love and respect look very good. <laughs> but you type in, is it me making sense of your confusing marriage and abuse, and it makes it look like a real good book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that like it's a really great way of just a really quick litmus test. You yeah. know, same thing with controversy where it's like, oh, they like plagiarize the whole book or like yeah. mm -hmm. th there's there's lots of different stuff you can do. And obviously, 
you can have discernment because you can say, well, that was just an obvious hit piece this here versus like, oh, there's like actual stories here of people who are harmed. So do your Googling, do it. But then the other thing you can do is if you go to the actual book itself on Goodreads, on Amazon, wherever it is, and you look at why it's getting one star reviews. Yeah, read the one star reviews. Those are the ones I always read. Especially the books that are like a 4.8. Yeah. Read the one stars. Yeah. 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 Every book's going to have one star reviews. It's not like mm-hmm. if it has one star reviews, it's a bad book. No. But ask why. Is it, oh, they're a crazy feminist. Yeah, that's, that's what we get. That's... They're just crazy unbiblical feminists. Yeah, that's it's what like, we get. Oh, yes. So unbiblical and so feminist say that, you know, yeah. women should matter. Yeah. If the one star reviews are really stupid, chances are it's a really good book. <laughs> Especially if the five star reviews are really, really good. Yeah. But if the one star reviews are very thoughtful and give a lot of quotes of the problems, then that's a good sign that this is not a Like if the thoughtful one-star reviews are things like, you know, this book really ruined my marriage. This kind of thing really harmed me. As someone who has suffered sexual abuse in the past, I found this quite triggering. Mm -hmm. You know, he makes all these biblical claims that are really cherry picking. Like you you should honestly look at those things because a lot Mm -hmm. of people will give something a five-star review without thinking. But the one-star reviews for a lot of these books, like Every Man's Battle, like Love and Respect, I, I have a hard time believing that any pastor would recommend them after he'd read those or after yeah. she'd read those, you know? Yeah. Okay, so there we go. That is our step-by-step guide to how to tell on your own if a book is good. <laughs> and I hope that's helpful. We did, there is a post that I wrote, um, I think earlier this week that goes into all of these points. So if you're more of a visual learner, I will put a link to that post that you can take a look at. But the big thing that we want you to think is, all right, you know, I can do this. Yeah. I am capable of telling if a book is good or not because you are, and I hope that we've that we've given you some tips. What if you don't think a book is good? What if you're really concerned about a book and your pastor is recommending it? We're going to talk to a pastor now about how to approach your pastor about that. Hello, everybody. This is the editor of the podcast just popping on to let you all know that due to a technical malfunction with Sheila's microphone during this interview, the audio on her end was quite unusable, which will be very clear when you hear her introduce our guest and introduce the topic for the interview today. I left a little bit of audio in of Sheila talking just to help provide some context, but I edited most of what she said out out of courtesy to everybody's ears. But I hope you enjoy this interview regardless, as we really enjoyed having this guest join us today. Hi, Neil. Hi, good morning, Sheila. I have brought you on because my readers keep asking me, how do I approach my pastor about the things that you bring up in the Great Sex Rescue? And I was thinking in order to answer that question, I need a pastor. And you came to mind because you're someone who's been really impacted by women's stories and you've become a big advocate um, for abuse and domestic violence awareness because of something that happened to you back in 2009. So I wonder if you can fill our, our listeners in on what happened to you, and then we'll try to answer our reader's question. Sure. Yeah, I served as the counseling pastor for a large church in the Chicago suburbs. Um, I really just met with people all day long talking about whatever their issues were in their lives and their marriage, gender issues, sexuality issues, pre-marriage, marriage, all the things. I met someone in the church named Stacy Peterson o- over the course of five to six sessions that I had with her individually and with her husband, Drew. Um, I found out in the final session with her that uh, she confided in me that her husband, Drew, had killed his previous wife, Kathleen Savio, and um, he made it look like it was an accident. So two months wow. later, Stacy disappeared. I went to the police immediately with that information, had a hard time getting them to pay attention to me, even though they'd set up a tip line about it. And... Um, I ended up in 2012 testifying against Drew Peterson for the murder of Kathleen Savio. He's in prison for that. Since then, he has attempted to hire his cellmate to kill the state's attorney who put him behind bars. Wow. And as a pastor, that must have just crushed you when she went missing. Oh, gosh. It, it, it crushed me in all sorts of ways. And <clears throat> we were just in similar life stages as well. My wife and I just had a brand new daughter. Stacy had a, a child around the same age. So um, they got to know each other a little bit. And it was just heartbreaking because of that similar demographic. Um, heartbreaking because I thought about all their kids would go through. And, and honestly, just heartbreaking for her having to deal with such horrible issues of domestic violence. And then me, even though I've got a master's in counseling, I wasn't trained in any area 
of domestic violence. I really had to put myself under teaching of experts in the field in order to get caught up to speed so that I could properly advocate for victims. I sort of joke with people, but it's true that I'm I'm probably the biggest feminist in my family and having <laughs> three daughters, <laughs> having three daughters um, really fuels that because I want them to know they can do anything. They're not limited in what they can do. I want them to know that they don't have to have someone to be whole, um, that they are more than enough as they are, and they should look for, look for people that will uh, build into their lives, not try to take over their lives. Just learn so many things. So when readers come to me and they say, like, I read, I read The Great Sex Rescue, and I, I know that my pastor loves a lot of the books that you critique and he thinks they're really helpful how do i show my pastor that these books are actually harmful do you have any words of wisdom on how the best way to approach a pastor with those kinds of concerns might be you know for, first of all just asking the question is so good because um one thing that i know just from human nature is that people tend to recoil and resist more if they feel as though people are coming at them. And, and, and that's more than just in the area of abusive um, theological teachings. It's just in general. That's just kind of how we are. We, we resist when someone, we, when we feel like someone is coming at us, we tend to resist. I, I think I'm that way. I think pretty much everybody is. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is how, like, so, so what do you do? And I think really pretty quickly, and I think this is with the Lord's help, I, and I don't mean to sound cliche, but I really think part of it is discerning um, what kind of pastor you're speaking to. Is it a pastor who really is open to hearing other things theologically? Is it a pastor who might be teachable? Um, is this the pastor with a good heart who just doesn't understand these dynamics? Is this a pastor who is kind, but is really focused on other things? I think those are really important things to identify. Also, I think it's super important to figure out what kind of a learner and processor that pastor is. For me, um, it wasn't that I didn't care about the issue of abuse. I just didn't really know about it and I hadn't mm -hmm. experienced it personally. So for me, I, I'm an experiential learner that when I get thrown into a situation, I get immersed in it and I and suddenly my feelings come alive. Like I'm I'm very I'm feelings driven once I'm immersed in a situation. So then I have to sort of sort through what's going on here and then what do I need to learn. So yeah, some some pastors are experiential learners. So that, I think that's more the kind of pastor that I am. It wasn't that I didn't care about the subject of abuse. I just didn't know about it. In seminary, even though I have a master's in counseling, I wasn't trained to recognize abuse and to address it. So because I wasn't trained to do that, I wasn't then looking for it. Mm -hmm. So when I met Stacy and Drew, my eyes started to become opened and then I cared. And it was, it was, unfortunately, I didn't know how to properly address Stacy and to really assist her. Um, but I, I, I asked the Lord after I said, Hey, Lord, I don't think I was in this position so that I would just know and be a part of this horrible situation. Why is it that you had Stacy come to me? And what mm -hmm. am I supposed to do with it now? So what role should I play? So I think there are some pastors that when they, they do experience the realities that you're sharing about um, the, the bad theology of books that, that they're sort of platforming, mm -hmm. I think some really are open to, to changing. So for me, stories are so powerful. Stories are incredible. Some people are more, in, some people are more um, research driven for me, I'm far more um, anecdotal. Like when I hear a story, it grabs my heart and attention. And when mm -hmm. someone says, this is what I used to believe. This was a book that, that shaped my marriage in a very negative way. I pay attention to that. And I'll, I'll ask a lot of questions like, tell me about your experience because experiences matter. And I mm -hmm. believe strongly that our theology needs to align. It needs to crisscross with our experience. Otherwise, it's not a theologic, it's not a theology that's practical. So I think that's the experiential side. But I think there really are two other, um, two other types. 
one type of pastor that I think overall is good and, and entered into ministry for the right reasons is the one that is more educationally driven. My wife really falls into that category. And, and I asked for her permission to, to sort of share a little bit about her and she granted it, um, which I, I think is super helpful. She pointed out to me, she said, when all this happened um, with the Drew and Stacy Peterson case, she said, it didn't really I didn't really understand it so well. She she would tell you today that 10 years ago, she would have said, I don't understand why women don't just leave. Mm -hmm. She would say that. Um, mm -hmm. Today, um, she understands it and she's a powerful advocate for victims because as she's gone through the process, she's been exposed to information and statistics and, and some stories. But when she's really, the, the more that she's read, the more statistics she's come across, it's like this dawning has occurred for her. And I think there are pastors, um, there are other pastors and people in ministry that really um, look at life that way. And I think one way that you can tell, what I think one kind of cue that you can take from a pastor is watch a few of the pastor's sermons and see um, how that pastor leads in sermons. A storytelling pastor, um, I often will lead with a story. I think storytelling pastors want to hear about the experience. I think other pastors are more teaching focused and those pastors are the ones that are going to dive into statistics and they're going to dive into research. Um, I think we get cues from them just from their own preaching and, uh, right. as to how to get into them to help them sort of be awakened um, mm -hmm. to the realities that, that you see every day. Yeah. That people are sharing with you. The third kind, um, I, I think on, on top of it all, I think we cannot discount the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't at all mean to be trite about that. I don't, I don't try to overly spiritualize things, but I do believe that there really are some people that want to do right, but they're doing wrong and they think it's God's way. Mm -hmm. I've encountered some of these pastors um, when it comes to theological issues that surround divorce, they, they think that they know the whole story about yeah. what God says about divorce when they read um, something out of context from Malachi and they think, see, God hates divorce. And I'm like, well, are you open to hearing about this? And most of them from me won't necessarily be, but I, I, a lot of times I'll just pray and say, God, I know that this pastor really wants, I see that this pastor wants to do right by you and has a, a high view of, of scripture. And I think that's great. So would you meet them in that place? And would you illuminate this for them so that they can see what I've learned over the last 10 years? And, and I've seen the spirit open people's eyes and hearts a whole lot more than I've been able to. So I really think those are three situations um, three kinds uh, of learners. I think there's a fourth kind that it's it's really, um, it's sort of the flip side. It's the antithesis of what we've been speaking to so far. I also think we have to know when this pastor really just isn't open. That can be for all sorts of reasons. There are just bad seeds, but I've encountered them. You've encountered them. I'd say most people have. And um, those uh, Maya Angelou said something beautiful years ago. I love her quote that she said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. <laughs> and, and I do believe that. And when you see pastors that are um, really trying to shoehorn a victim into staying with an abuser and they don't, they're not willing to hear um, the victim story. Um, they're hearing about what dangerous teachings on sex have done to a marriage and, and, and just, this mm -hmm. just sort of wrecked everything and they're still unwilling to bend. I think sometimes you just have to know when it's just time to cut and run. This person isn't interested in conversation. I have said many times when you encounter someone that is so obstinate in that way, might even be evil. I, I, I don't like to throw that out too often, but sometimes people mm -hmm. really are just driven by evil. I think you just have to recognize this isn't someone who's willing to, or, or interested in having an actual conversation. And, and a lot of times when you enter the ring and have a conversation, mm -hmm. um, you just experience the crazy making that they have kind of perpetrated on their congregations. So sometimes you just have to know this isn't someone to have a talk with. Yeah, very true. 
hope that really helped you. Um, go to our podcast notes so that you can download that rubric um, so that you can find information about Neil, all kinds of other things. We always have so much stuff in the podcast notes. Visit me on tolovehonoredvacuum.com. Right now, Keith and I are not even home. We are down east. We're recording this podcast early because we are actually on vacation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Although the, the blog is up and running as normal. So follow me on Instagram and hopefully I'll be posting some pictures from the east coast. Yeah, and if you have any tips or tricks for how you tend to judge if a book is healthy or not yeah. too, mm-hmm. leave them in the comments. We'd Absolutely. love to see if you have any great ideas that we don't have here. That's awesome. Yeah, because maybe we can do a follow-up post. So thank you for joining us. Tune in more on slovehonorvacuum.com. Remember that you can support our research on Patreon um, for as little as $5 a month. We have a super awesome Facebook group and there's all kinds of other perks and it just helps us get our research and peer-reviewed journals because that can't be monetized. So thank you for joining us there and join our email list. And I think that's all the announcements. I think that's it. And so we will see you again next week on the Mirror Marriage Podcast. Bye. Bye. Bye.